welcome to our program and uh, today I welcome my guest. Uh, it's Natalie Tochi, it's a political scientist and director of the Instituto Fari Internazionali at Vienna. The, Am I right? That Am is right? in Rome, in Rome, but in Rome. it's perfectly pronounced. So okay. I'm very impressed. Okay, <laughs> I tried before, so I tested myself. Anyways, we talk a lot about Ukraine everywhere on television, but today um, including your uh, experience, I would like to know a little bit more about Europe and what's going on in Europe right now. And I'd like to start uh, from uh, the uh, your latest article in Politico that I read. Uh, in this issue, you conclude that uh, while the United States can ensure that Russia loses uh, this war, only the uh, European Union can ensure Ukraine wins it. And uh, for this, it needs to do more. So can you please point the top changes uh, you noticed in Europe's perception of Russia in uh, European Union and around the world of, I'd say, big politics uh, since the 24th of February? Well, well, firstly, it's a real pleasure to be on uh, on this show. I'm very, very happy to, to be here. I mean, I would say that as far as views on Russia are concerned, um, Europeans are actually not divided. I mean, you know, Russia used to be probably one of the most divisive subjects in, uh, in European foreign policy, uh, with countries like my own, Italy, that tended to be rather supportive of Russia, countries in Eastern Europe that used to traditionally be very uh, skeptical. So it was always a very divisive subject. Um, I think that beginning on, you know, 24th uh, of February, uh, that has changed. And, and I think that has changed for good. Uh, what I mean by this is that you will not find anyone in Europe that actually, at least overtly, explicitly supports Russia. So that's kind of game over. Now, what you do find in Europe, of course, are different views. And these different views relate, I would say, not so much uh, to, you know, hey, don't we, you know, sort of, do, do, do we support Putin? No one really does. I mean, perhaps, you know, very, very small minorities here and there. But, uh, you know, I would say that there are elements of European public opinion and to an extent, perhaps, uh, some governments that are, I would say, particularly tempted by... Point number one, the, how can I put it, the allure of peace, the sirens of peace, mm -hmm. peace, 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 and of course peace in this particular context uh, tends to then translate into, well, the war must stop now, and for the war to stop now, of course, this also entails that Ukraine must stop uh, in its liberation campaign. So, in a sense, covered, quote unquote, with the language of peace, and you know, who's against peace? No one can be against peace. Uh, you then tend to have, in a sense, some pro-Russian views that tend to come in back through the back door. I would say that a second set of uh, sort of concerns uh, which then again, not explicitly, but in a sense implicitly, uh, risk going into, in a sense, uh, a, a Russian narrative, is obviously everything surrounding the energy crisis, the uh, economic crisis, uh, and, and therefore the idea of, which again is, is an illusion, you know, the idea of if only the war were to stop, we could go back to the good old days. Now, the good old days uh, were not that good, and they're certainly gone. Uh, but I would say that, again, amongst some quarters of European public opinion, you would tend to have, you know, this question of, uh, you know, I get it a lot on social media. I mean, every time since the beginning of the war, you know, initially, obviously, speaking out very strongly um, in favor of energy sanctions, uh, now, you know, really sort of holding the line, saying, you know, these sanctions have to uh, be there. They have to strength, be strengthened. Them, they certainly uh, cannot be removed. You know, you would get sort of, you know, people are on social media coming out at you and saying, hey, you know, are you going to be paying my energy bills, therefore? Mm -hmm. So you would have, in a sense, both through that energy angle and through the peace, uh, if you like, angle, some pro-Russian views that kind of creep back into the debate. Now, having said all this, 
Do I therefore think that these views are going to prevail uh, or that they're going to lead uh, Europe to actually reduce its support for Ukraine? Absolutely not. I mean, I hear on screen put my hand, well, I don't put my hand, but I, you know, figuratively put my hand on fire, you know, sort of very confident that um, it will not lead to a reduction of, of support uh, for Ukraine. Now, the argument, uh, coming back to my political piece, the argument that I make in that piece is that it's not good enough not to reduce support. <laughs> the point is that actually we have to increase the support uh, we provide for Ukraine. Now, I make comparisons uh, between uh, Europe and the United States. And, you know, in fairness, this is, you know, in some respects, a little bit unfair mm -hmm. uh, to make this comparison, but I make it nonetheless. I say it's unfair because in many ways, uh, Europe has been shouldering indirectly uh, a lot of the costs of this war. In many respects, more, far more so than the United States. Uh, one only needs to think about the, the cost, uh, uh, the human and the economic cost of hosting uh, millions of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, and this is cost to states, but it's also cost to individual families. Uh, you know, my own family, we've been hosting a, fa you know, a Ukrainian family uh, since March of, uh, of this year. So there, there, there is that and there's a lot of that obviously going on, uh, which it obviously is far more you know, prominent in Europe compared to the United States. And then, of course, there's also the cost that is much higher in Europe of the energy crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, in the United States, you know, sort of uh, uh, Americans complain about the high uh, gas prices at the petrol station. But if you look at the differences, I mean, there's literally no comparison uh, whatsoever. And of course, we know that those rising energy costs are a consequence of Russia's weaponization uh, of energy, which is part and parcel of, of this war. So I kind of put those two caveats there, because otherwise it, it kind of looks like, you know, my criticism is a little bit unfair, uh, looking at Europe and the United States. But having said all this, I think that it's still worth highlighting the fact that why should we be doing more? And here I come back to the conclusion uh, of that piece. We should be doing more because, as I say in that piece, although militarily, uh, it is the United States that will make a difference in terms of Ukraine defeating Russia, because you defeat Russia militarily. Uh, but in terms of Ukraine winning, Ukraine will not win only militarily. Ukraine will win uh, if it uh, consolidates as a uh, liberal democracy, if its, uh, if its economic reconstruction uh, is ongoing, uh, if its security is going to be guaranteed. And all of those things, cannot rely on the United States. This is mainly a European affair. I see. But uh, talking about uh, the attitude of people, of the societies of different countries of uh, the European Union, we understand that uh, first, uh, each country has uh, its own abilities to help Ukraine. I mean, there's difference in economical situation among the countries of European Union. And the second thing is uh, the informational uh, fields that we have for different countries of European Union. I mean, uh, you're talking about the energetic crisis and the prices that are rising, that people thinking about it, people not afraid to be cold in winter, they're afraid uh, to not be possible to pay for these energetic uh, needs and so on. So do people of Europe, it doesn't matter, Western Europe or Eastern Europe, really uh, understand the depth that you just uh, told me? I mean, not only we have to win Russia uh, because uh, it will save our nation, but because we are really defending European uh, values. So do these people understand, do this enough uh, informational messages in uh, press, in social media, in European countries? And who is making this informational field? 
Hmm. Well, I think, you know, some countries obviously do very much. I mean, you know, those countries in Eastern Europe uh, that have been also exposed to kind of Russian and, and Soviet colonialism uh, uh, have very clear in their mind that, uh, what this war is all about. So I would say that countries in Eastern Europe, um, both governments and public opinion uh, is very, you know, are very clear on all of this. Um, of course, you know, we can, you know, look at Hungary and countries like, you know, Bulgaria, obviously being slightly different in this respect, but by and large, I would say that this is understood. Now, you know, countries in, in Western Europe, in Southern Europe, um, I would say that broadly speaking, governments understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, whether this is uh, Italy or France or Spain or Germany, I think governments understand it. Uh, you know, governments then obviously have to deal with all of the complexities of, and therefore, what does it mean to understand it? Huh? Uh, because, of course, you obviously need to, um, you know, sort of policy is made of, of, of choices and, and kind of, you know, difficult choices at times. You want to support Ukraine, but you need to ensure that your uh, citizens are able to pay their gas bills, uh, and that requires money. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, how do you allocate the funds that you have available? So I think governments understand the stakes which, of course, does not make uh, it like solutions, easy solutions, but they understand that they need to find them. I would say that public opinion in uh, countries that are further away from the front lines, so countries in Southern Europe, countries in Western Europe, I would say that they understand that, that this is a war that is about values. I think they do understand it. Uh, I think the question becomes trickier when it then translates into, and therefore, what is the price that you are willing to pay uh, in order to defend uh, those values? And, you know, I mean, one thing is governments, one thing is, you know, experts, uh, foreign policy people, in a sense, like, like myself. Um, and, and quite another is, you know, the layman uh, or the laywoman on the street uh, that has daily problems that are far removed uh, from Ukraine, or rather, apparently far removed from Ukraine. So I think, and this gets into the story about information, uh, or rather disinformation, um, I think that their you know, narratives are fundamentally important. That lay man or lay woman on the street uh, needs to understand that this is not about values in a kind of abstract sense, uh, because their economic prosperity, their uh, freedoms, their security, and their ability to pay gas bills as well, mm -hmm. this is actually fundamentally connected to not only this war, but this war that needs to be won, you know, in, in, in a particular way. So, you know, this is where uh, information comes in, but then also where disinformation comes in, uh, because it's, you know, it's not just about getting the facts out, it's about getting the story out, it's about getting the narrative right. When you say that governments understand, uh, I uh, would like to go to the uh, some past interviews of you, and I found some interesting quotes uh, from the internet. So I will quote the the conversation uh, w with you. So Europe will not risk its stability and habitual way of life, warmth and of homes, and the work of industry because of the country that doesn't even exist. It's how Putin showed Ukraine before in an informational war. So Putin has been preparing this informational not only for his population, but also for European society that affects decisions in the European Union parliaments and with the money raining on the politicians that allowed him all these manipulations through years. So my question is whether all these politicians uh, were aware of what they are doing or that uh, they uh, just were very blind and simply illiterate that they as well believed in all these words of Kremlin and uh, counted the gifts in euros and dollars from Putin's hands. And really, situation mm -hmm. changed right now. So do you see the pol 
politicians that were corrupted by Russian money are opened now and they're not at the power right now? So I would kind of, you know, obviously these things are, are connected, but I would uh, make the distinction between, um, in a sense, the in a sense, it's a sort of a, the distinction between the values and the interests. Huh? I mean, they're obviously interrelated, but, but they're slightly different stories. So I think that as far as the, if you like, ideational, the value side of all of this, um, I do think that prior to this war, there was quite a bit of ignorance uh, across Europe uh, and by the way, I think actually in the United States too, yeah. for reasons that I'll come to it in a moment, about um, how much the Ukrainian nation had actually developed in recent years. Um, you know, there was a widespread assumption in the months leading up to the war, where as we no U.S. intelligence, uh, U.K. intelligence were really making, you know, the case of, hey, you know, a war is about to start. Um, but there was, uh, which of course was, was right, uh, but where I think everyone in the West, including the United States, got it very wrong, was in assuming that Ukraine would not hold up. Now, that assumption, which turned out to be, of course, a wrong assumption, you know, one has to sort of try and understand why was that assumption so wrong? So, on the one hand, of course, one can say, well, because obviously there was an overestimation of Russia's military capacities, which I think is one side of the story. But I think the other side of the story, which gets to this ignorance uh, point that I wanted to highlight, is that there was an underestimation of Ukrainian resilience. And there was an underestimation of Ukrainian resilience because, of course, without buying completely the Russian narrative of the Ukrainian nation doesn't exist, so without going that far, there were still some doubts as to, you know, to what extent, you know, is Ukraine, you know, is Ukraine and Ukrainian identity really strong enough uh, to stand up to Russia? Uh, so, you know, Propaganda doesn't necessarily, you know, and disinformation doesn't necessarily mean that you buy 100% of the rubbish that is being mm -hmm. sold to you. But if you just buy 20%, you know, that's, uh, that's also a problem. So I think there was, I would say, ignorance in, in that respect. And I think that indeed the way in which... Uh, the war has gone, particularly the way in which Ukraine uh, resisted in those very early days of the war, uh, really kind of, they, they really led to a, a very abrupt change in, in European uh, perceptions and, of course, American uh, perceptions too. Then I think there's the, um, in a sense, the, the commercial interests, perhaps the, the corruption, I mean, you know, the, the interests part of, uh, of this story. Now, I would say that, you know, even without getting into corruption, um, there were obviously uh, quite a lot of commercial interests going on. Uh, and, you know, so that it is true that uh, Europe was hooked on cheap Russian gas. You know, one, that was not corruption. Uh, it was basically a kind of commercial uh, relationship uh, that was um, thought of as being a win-win for both. And this is something that, you know, dates back from Ostpolitik, uh, and it dates back from, from Cold War uh, days. Yes. Uh, and I think progressively, as time went on, the convenience of that relationship made us as Europeans increasingly blind to the fact that this was not just a commercial relationship. The time would come, and in fact the time came, when that relationship, as we now see, became weaponized. And so in many respects, we are now paying the price of the blindness. So I highlight this because I think this is the main story. Yes, you know, maybe on the margins there's some corruption here, corruption there, but I think the main problem, in a sense, was not seeing that the economic and energy relationship between Europe and Russia was not just economic and, uh, and energy, but it was really very
very, you know, political, politicized and securitized. Unfortunately, there were at least two times uh, when it was time to pay attention to this alarm. First, uh, when uh, Russia manipulated with gas, it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2007. Yeah, 2000, when, exactly, 2006 yes. and 2009 yeah, again. Yes. And we didn't do yes. anything. And next time, when uh, all of uh, our parliament uh, uh, members and uh, our neighbor countries from uh, Western Europe uh, were shouting out not letting Putin build this northern uh, pipe too. Uh, so nobody listened to it. And uh, backing uh, to the quotes from the interviews against with you, I see one more quote. Europe made two global mistakes. One, bet on the hope for security from the United States since uh, 1945. And the second one is belief in energy security support by Russia and building this Northern Stream altogether. It's like commercial project. But uh, anyways, uh, all of the countries with normal psychic, they were thinking that it's commercial and it's uh, for the future interest, but not about schizophrenic dreams of some sick dictator. So uh, now you see Europe uh, fixes these two main mistakes. Well, I would say, in fact, I think there are three uh, like dangerous dependencies. I think there's the energy dependence, uh, of course, with, with Russia. There's the defense dependence on the United States. And there's the economic dependence on China. Yes. Uh, and I think all these three things are, you know, sort of similar but very different stories. So I'm where I'm very optimistic is, is actually uh, on Russia. <laughs> uh, I think that the die is cast on, you know, I think that the energy, Europe's energy dependence on Russia is game over. If you think of it, it's really quite surprising that in seven months, um, we have gone down from 40% of gas dependence on, uh, uh, on Russia to around 9% in seven months. Uh, oil is basically when the embargo kicks in at the end of this year, will go to zero. So, you know, this is really a, a kind of Copernican revolution that has happened in, in seven months. And there isn't a world in which, let's say, the war ends tomorrow morning. Yeah? Even if the war were to end tomorrow morning, Europe is not going to go back to that energy dependence with Russia. Because now that it is clear that energy, that it was not, as we were saying earlier, just a commercial relationship, mm -hmm. uh, but that it was a, a politicized and securitized relationship, there is no way that European companies, European governments are going to go back. It's, it's game over. Uh, so on that, I'm actually very optimistic. Excuse me, it's, uh, we're talking about if uh, Putin stays but war stops, or if uh, the political system changes in Russia, I nothing think, will to go... To be honest, okay. I think it's too late now. Too late. Uh, because it is, you know, we, we are now suffering so much the consequences of, of, of what has happened that there's no trust anymore that Russia is a reliable energy provider. Uh, that is, that credibility has gone. Whether it's Putin or whether it's someone else, uh, I mean, you know, unless Russia tomorrow morning becomes a shining liberal democracy, but that is far less likely even than the war ending tomorrow morning. I mean, mm. that's just not going to happen, right? So I, I think on energy, it's going to be painful. Uh, because it's happened in a very rapid way, but I think it's irreversible. Where I think the story is more mixed is uh, our economic dependence on China. The United States is going to push us very much uh, in terms of loosening that relationship. I think that we as Europeans, especially since the pandemic, understand uh, that you know, this is not just an economic relationship. But again, it's an economic relationship with a strategic edge. So I think even without uh, US persuading, um, we would be, in a sense, we, we want to be more cautious. And I think the point is how to find a new balance 
in a sense, between security and efficiency, between security and, and prosperity. And I think that's a new uh, balance that will need to be found. Where I'm less optimistic is actually on defense. Now, it is true that uh, Europe is waking up on defense. Uh, it is spending more on defense um, as a consequence of, of this war, and, and finally this is happening. But it doesn't mean that our dependence on the United States is actually reducing. It is actually increasing. Uh, and it's increasing because as we buy military equipment, a lot of this equipment is American. And it's American because Europeans are still developing theirs. Mm -hmm. and, and given that you need it now, you buy what is available. And what is available is, is a lot of buy American. Now, you may say, well, what, why is that a problem? And I would reply, well, today it's not a problem. Today we have Joe Biden sitting in the White House. Not a problem. But what if tomorrow uh, you have Trump, uh, you have another Republican president uh, that, like Trump did, questions uh, NATO's Article 5? Where would it leave us, you know, at a time in which we are, of course, you know, you, Ukraine, you're on, in a sense, the front line, but this is a war. I mean, Russia is de facto at war with Europe as a whole um, by sabotaging critical infrastructure, by weaponizing energy, by, you know, cyber, I mean, you know, all of the other aspects uh, of, of this war. So I think the de defense dependence on the United States uh, continues to be, I think, a real reason for concern, and I would add, I think it should be not only a reason for European concern, I actually think it should be a reason for American concern as well. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about China, I've heard uh, an interesting question uh, from the audience, so I will just uh, repeat it. The longer the war, the greater the benefit to China, financial and political. All Russia's energy resources go there instead of the U European Union, and Russia is completely dependent on China. So we're going back to bipolar world, and what role Europe will play in this bipolar world? I think it's a really, really good question. Um, now, you know, I think you can, one can look at it in different ways. So on one level, I think, yes, it's absolutely correct. China, in many ways, has been benefiting uh, from, uh, uh, from this war. Uh, it is uh, getting quite a lot of uh, Russian oil at a very big discount. Now, I don't think that uh, China is going to be getting the Russian gas that Russia no longer sends to Europe because gas, unlike oil, requires the building of infrastructure. Uh, and this, if it happens, it will happen in a long time. I think there's then a long-term question about, you know, on the one hand, one can make the argument that China is going to benefit from Russia basically being a very, very diminished country, uh, economically, strategically, militarily, energetically, I mean, in all possible ways. And, you know, essentially, uh, Russia is going to be sort of, you know, China's junior cousin. Now, I think on one level you can say that. On another, it really depends on, on what happens right, in this war. I mean, what happens to Russia? Because if Russia, in a sense, kind of turns into a massive North Korea, to what extent and, and what are the political implications in Russia itself over time, to what extent is this not a burden actually to China as well? Question mark. So I think it largely depends on how exactly Russia is going to develop as a consequence of what is happening now uh, with, with the war. And then I would say in terms of the question of kind of, you know, is this a new bipolarity? I think yes, in the sense that it is very clear that the world, you know, to put it a la Joe Biden, you know, is kind of divided between democracies and autocracies. Although I also think that this is not going to be like the Cold War. I mean, during the Cold War, bipolarity was really two blocks that were separate and hardly connected with one another. I think that 
for all the talk of decoupling that we were talking about earlier, there's always going to be a degree of interdependence uh, in this new bipolar uh, world. There isn't going to be just the United States and uh, China. There's also going to be Europe. There are going to be other powers. So it's not going to be a kind of, you know, a replica of the Cold War, but based on... Ideo not, ideolo not, not ideologic. It will be more uh, commercial economic, uh, I mean, uh, environmental yeah, in, questions in, like this. Right? Exactly. In, in some areas, like indeed climate, there will need to be cooperation. In other areas, like defense or mm. uh, even digital, probably very little cooperation. I mean, those areas that are more connected to security are probably going to see a greater separation. Okay, then a few more questions, if you please. Uh, I would like to understand uh, the, uh, your view on the uh, mobility of the European Union. And if you uh, look back uh, when uh, everything started, uh, I've heard, read today again the speech of uh, Putin on, in Munich uh, in 2007, uh, when uh, actually he pronounced everything that he planned. That he's going to do. That he's going to do, actually. Yes, no, nobody paid attention on this. This, and uh, do you think uh, it could happen if it wasn't European Union but different countries of Europe? Because uh, it started like economical union, then it, be it became the, the real political, economical, uh, geopolitical union. So could it happen if it was separate countries? Could he win the attention of politicians and could throw all this money into different countries? And uh, uh, on the example of Great Britain that made uh, Brexit and now is very, very effective in helping Ukraine because it's uh, much more movable, so men never, they can do without all this bureaucracy, so they decided that they do it. So how movable and how free in the moves now European Union and will it change its bureaucratic basis that uh, uh, stops to do fast decisions? Well, I would say that, um, look, let me put it this way. It's an old colonial tactic, divide and rule. So it is very clear that if you are Russia looking at Europe, if you are China looking at Europe, you have an interest in Europeans being divided. If Europeans are united, there's a critical mass, strategic, economic, political, etc., power that makes it extremely difficult, basically, for uh, uh, an external adversary like Russia to, to divide you. So, you know, I think that for all the criticism that we may have of the European Union, it's slow, it's bureaucratic, it's cumbersome, but Thank goodness it exists, mm -hmm. because without it, uh, our security, not only our prosperity, but our security uh, would be, I think, very much imperiled. And indeed, you know, one only needs to look at what is happening in the United Kingdom these days to realize what an absolutely catastrophic decision Brexit was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that the chaos in, in this country, which makes my country uh, look almost stable, <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely incredible, um, you know, trying to put in place the kind of economic policy that Liz Truss had presented, inevitably, if you are small, quote-unquote, United Kingdom, and you're not big European Union or big United States, mm -hmm. you simply can't do that, basically. <laughs> Otherwise, you pay the kind of consequences that Liz Truss paid. Okay, it's an interesting question for uh, another discussion. Hopefully, we will have a chance to talk about it uh, later, just about this exact situation. But in the end, I want to ask you about Ukraine. Uh, sure, we understand we have to stop and win the war, stop it, finally. Then we have to reconstruct and rebuild Ukraine. It's a, that's a huge money. And uh, hopefully, it will be the reparation from the Russian uh, freezing uh, accounts uh, in the European 
banks or whatever, and Europe will help to rebuild our country. But my question is, how Europe now, from uh, observing how we struggle for our nation, is Europe ready for strong new country in the, your union, like Ukraine? At what place Ukraine you are ready to give for us? You know, I think that um, what is going to be um, fundamentally important, which is why I put so much emphasis on uh, on Europe and on Ukraine-European relations, is that, you know, to the extent that Ukraine is a consolidated liberal democracy uh, and uh, a country that economically is, you know, will get back on its feet, is going to be a massive asset to the European Union. Now, it's not a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen. Um, it is considering that Russia is going to remain a threat even after the end of this war, uh, there is a risk of Ukraine remaining a hyper-militarized country. And a hyper-militarized country does not necessarily kind of go hand in hand with a liberal democracy. And given that Russia is going to remain a threat, the economic reconstruction is not going to be such a foregone conclusion. So I say all this simply to highlight the fact that in order to increase the chances of all of this happening, there needs to be, even before Ukraine is actually accepted in the European Union, there needs to be an accession process that delivers the benefits very early on in this process. Without it, Ukraine, I fear, will not be able to do it alone. It has to do it together with the European Union. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, finally, you say you are not skeptics because I uh, I, I talked before with the, your with the experts in, in politicians. I've heard a lot of skeptical points of view that uh, as long as uh, the war stops, uh, they more think that uh, the previous status quo will got back. So you are not skeptical. You are optimistic no, no, no. on this question. No, I'm I'm absolutely sure about this. I mean, uh, there's no going back to the past. The future is not necessarily rosy, but there's definitely not going back to the past. This is where, why I wanted to stress at the end of our conversation. I thank you very much for finding time for us. And for thank our, you. Thank you. For our audience, I uh, remind that uh, we were talking with Natalie Tochi, uh, director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali, and uh, the political scientist, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk more. Thank you. Thank you.